Welcome, everyone, to the 2021 Philip Freund Prize Reading for Creative Writing Alumni. I am Lyra A. Van Cleef Stefanen. I am an associate professor in literatures and English here at Cornell. Cornell University is located on the traditional homelands of the Goyacono, the Cayuga Nation. The Goyacono are members of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, an alliance of six sovereign nations with a historic and contemporary presence on this land. The Confederacy precedes the establishment of Cornell University, New York State, and the United States of America. We acknowledge the painful history of the Goyacono, dispossession, and honor the ongoing connection of Goyacono people, past and present, to these lands and waters. Um, it is my duty to remind everyone of the indoor mask mandate, I guess except for if you're standing right here by yourself, <laughs> and ask all to be conscientious about social distancing. It is also time to remind everyone to turn off or silence your cell phones and devices. Thank you. Um, there will not be a QA and a um, in the auditorium after the reading tonight, but people can attend the book signing and ask questions of our alumni here. Books by the authors are available for sale um, here in the auditorium, thanks to Buffalo Street Books, and can be purchased after the reading. Except Renia's book is on pre-order because it, um, Renia's uh, I'm just talking like everybody know Renia, like I know Renia. Renia White's book, Casual Conversation, won't be available until spring of 2022, but Buffalo Street Books has arranged for guests to pre-order at the reading tonight. You can fill out an order form and pay at the book sales table and then receive a book plate that Renia can sign upstairs. And then you can stick that book plate in your copy of Casual Conversation when it is delivered. So um, there will be book signing of, with the otters immediately following the reading, but not in the auditorium. It will be upstairs in the English Lounge, which is in 258, right upstairs. Philip Freund, class of 29, MA, class of 32, was a novelist short story writer, poet, documentary film writer, playwright, television dramatist, essayist, and literary critic. The Philip Freund Prize for Creative Writing honors graduates upon their successful publication. So let's get us started. I'm going to be very, very brief in my introductions, but I hope that everybody will realize that my brief introductions are definitely not from a lack of love for these people who are sitting in front of me. I could not be more proud to be standing up here introducing this particular group of folks. Beginning with Julie Phillips Brown, MFA 08, PhD 2011, poet. Julie Phillips Brown is an interdisciplinary poet, artist, critic, and editor. I just love saying all of those things together and, you know, fighting for the reality of that person being allowed to exist in the world. She is the author of The Adjacent Possible, winner of the Hopper Poetry Prize, and the founding editor of House Mountain Review. She has held research fellowships in contemporary poetry and poetics from the Society for Humanities at Cornell University and the Fox Center for Humanistic Inquiry at Emory University. Her recent work appears in Revolut, The Rumpus, Twickenham Notes, Vassa Review, and elsewhere. I spent my formative years in the shadow of House Mountain in Lexington, Virginia, and I know how much that area needs and appreciates your brilliance. And I want to congratulate you on the, on the inaugural House Mountain Review and on the Fre Freund Prize. I am just so proud to be able to say congratulations and welcome. Uh, 
Lyrae's a little taller than me. <laughs> Thank you, Lyrae. Thank you so much to the Department of Literatures and English, the Creative Writing Program, and the Philip Friend Prize uh, uh, Endowment, sorry, for this incredible honor. I'm thrilled to be here um, and thrilled to get to hear my fellow writers share their work. I'm gonna read a little bit from The Adjacent Possible, um, but I'm gonna bookend it with some, some more recent poems. Um, and I will start. With, um, with this poem, Bop Lunario Heros, um, I learned the Bop form from Lyrae. Bop Lunario Heros. We begin with the umbilicus, the whirls between me and you, the curve of shell as the snail snakes around itself. Lunario Heros, large as a child's palm. My foot found it first, tender arch cupped to cool dome. And I bent down, feeling for its edges until my fingers clutched, then wrenched muscles, tendons, bones together. This heaven was nothing like I expected. It was at the bottom of the sea. Lunadia Heros, I held you the moon in my palm. As I hold your child's face now, your eyes lucent as the first time you held your face too close to mine and thought to kiss your mama. I lost you, Lunaria Heros, the way most children do. We sold that house, all our belongings put away, and somewhere I must have left you. If I returned, then perhaps you would be there still, on the ledge in summer haze, where I saw you last. This heaven was nothing like I expected. It was at the bottom of the sea. It may be you are my north star, my sun, my northern moon snail shell. Here we are now, our eyes primordial mirrors to share the stolen light between us. But I still want her, Lunadia Heros, and my mother's song at dawn, the open window, father undone with laughter and brother burbling. I want to go back, my child's heart, I would give it to you, this heaven at the bottom of the sea. General Theory. On September 14th, 2015, the LIGO Scientific Collaboration observed the first gravitational waves from two colliding black holes, confirming the final undetected prediction of Einstein's theory of general relativity. Poincaré first predicted in 1905 the existence of gravitational waves their radiant curve of space-time, how skin, muscle, echo sinew, bone. Then again, Einstein in 1916. Little theory of our world, its gravity. And one billion years before all this, though before is a misnomer, years a, th a thermodynamic accident, two black holes fell together, bodiless to bodiless dark. The hour of your birth, their wedded sound arrived on earth, our human ear tipped toward cosmic pulse, the sonographer's song. Little theory, this heart the size of an American black walnut. I plucked you from darkness, tucked you in my own lightless body. I hope you will forgive this wanting for you. Years later, though later may be a misnomer too, the only way we have of knowing time. You tell me how long you expect you will love me. 
Until the last number, you say. Now I am already counting the spill of integers, wondering when it became thinkable, how even our universe will pull itself apart. Those are poems from my son, Aiden, who's six, and never wants to read the poems about him. <laughs> He's not interested. Um, so The Adjacent Possible um, is a book that traces um, the relationship between two figures um, as they negotiate what I call intersubjective difference, the fact that we are all always um, illegible uh, and opaque to one another. Um, and these poems were entirely written in the beginning in Ithaca. Many of them are sort of plein air poems, so they're written down on the inlet um, where my house was on Seneca Street. And I'm going to read the section from the section called Winter, um, since it's fast approaching, even though it feels pretty good right now in November. This is the first section, substrata. Whole fields curved to the sway of if, unwritten as it is, indeterminate, interminate, without hints, without hue, white, without I, without you, without, and yes to is, to does, yes to and, or alternatively to or, yes to winter fruit and other nouns, to adjectival, adverbial, rongers, and these flurried noises, yes, voices scrattle in the white cacophony of if, fully luminous. And this is winter. And I should say these are, these are high bun, they're exploded high bun, so there's a prose passage followed by a, a haiku. Morning, the field curves toward the river, edges fringed with winter sedge. Wind grazes an undulation of white hills. Waves of grasses stand as antennae, cast wide the prescient crackle. The cold air blazes on, which is the most Ithaca sentence in this book. Freighters haze over backs of hills, Horns sounding down through the valley. The hills course, wake with industry, moat and floss upon a dazzled iris, heron in the reeds. Jet streak streams, white rough, across a canopy of downed silt. Snowdraft slows in untraceable directions, blooms in pale opulence. On the banks, particulars accrete, make a white. Houses crowd the hills and pine brush. There is an exhaustion of stars and fire bright, leaves, gray cumuli gray, swollen, solidly. Only a blackbird, silhouette, darts through it here, here, there pricks an unsystematic filigree over the distance. An atmosphere vined thick with weather, banks laden with the white of it. Clouds hold their encodings, their cyclonic ignitions, techne undertow. Someone's fold wings to their bodies, their fluttered keels first to surface. They duck alternate as they swim through or range over intermittent ice flats. They feather edges of white moving among other whites, a precise pantomime, camouflage of everywhere else. Squad of reedy faces, bright eyes seethe from the mud beds. A white river of animate particulars blocks as the abstract intent toward that empirical, real. Some ones roll over the water now. Their arms make a line of herringbone angles. Each oar pierces the water, 
sweeps flustered mallards to either side. One sits astride the stern, calls to each of the others how to move their limbs, their bodies, how breathe, how skim. This is how one moves a craft. Arms advance forward, backward, however, together. Twist topography, miscellany of rain. One other stands on the blotted riverbank. Light snow forms, hints at falling, sifts loosely among the stones and water edge. Across the sun glare, the side-swept surface spreading, one waves in passing. And just two more poems. For you, unborn. For you, unborn, are the smallest theft. I am dumbstruck by every possible name for you, the topography of your face not yet begun within me, pressed beneath the arced horizon of my abdomen. All this splits. You are born, you are not. You breathe, you do not. One day I will break this poem, stud the sweep of an inlet willow with loosed characters. No one can tell how to survive. No one can tell me what I want to know, how you might still be one day, how then I will write the elegy for every universe in which you are not born, in which you lived but died. Who can tell which reality is cruel or plain, whether worlds replete with you will repay this measure of sorrow each time the record of the universe skips on cosmic dust on. A child. Epigraph is from Benjamin on language as such in the language of man. To be named, even when the namer is godlike and blissful, perhaps always remains an intimation of mourning. I want a name to welcome you to earth, to pull you from heaven's own head, bowed with blossoms. You perch in the white, in dogwood, our nest spun, summer gold spent for Scythia blown green. Here, rust belly of the robin, rounded low with eggs. For you, I will pull down the sky, Strip the fuchsia from the crepe myrtle, sign your name in the radiance of its ink. I have never known the name for you, though I call you many things. Cage of fingers, their heart-shaped flexion. Late song sung through silence, the pomegranate's ruby, the chant of my own name into senselessness. You. Night wonder, still orbit, my mare desideri, sea of dreams, this heaven of waking mothers, our prayers, your name, your name. Thank you. I'm uh, Stephanie Bunn. Oh, <laughs> hello. Um, so there are three poets here today being balanced by one fiction writer, <laughs> Lena Wynn. Uh, Lena, welcome. Actually, I want to welcome all of you. I remember you all, and I remember how you all made us feel happy to be in the program when you were here. You were that good, but you were also that nice. 
And it's amazing because niceness is not a criterion for being a writer <laughs> or a graduate student, I might add. But, but these four were very special. And um, I'm very happy to see you come back. Uh, so I'm here to introduce Lena. Uh, Lena is, um, is both a fiction writer and, as it turns out, a game developer. Uh, she was raised in Phoenix, Arizona, graduated from Arizona State uh, before coming to Cornell uh, for an MFA in fiction. I'd like to say that we taught her something, but she was one of those fully formed writers when she got here. She knew just what she wanted to do, and she did it. <clears throat> uh, she wrote a thesis that has now become a book, and that book is We Were Always Here. Um, I, I left my copy there in my hurry to get to the stand, but there are many copies over there, and I hope you'll have a look at it. She describes it herself as a post-apocalyptic science fiction thriller featuring a misanthropic psychologist and her android companions as they voyage on a haunted spaceship. <clears throat> I, think that, I think that does a lot to describe it. I would add that it's a compelling book. It's an edge of the seat book, as well as a funny and sometimes unexpectedly tender book. It's especially unexpected when Dr. Grace Park, the protagonist, feel, feels great tenderness for an android. It was new to me, and it was touching, and it was sad. Uh, it's amazing how many ranges of feeling uh, I felt reading this book. Because science fiction is always as much about the present as it is about the future, the book contains oblique, very trenchant, oblique commentaries on many of the issues we're confronting now such as climate change and the use and ownership of technology by giant corporations. However, I'm not reading novels because I want to think about climate change. <laughs> it's interesting to get that when I get to it, but I'm reading them because I want to turn the pages and I want to be made to turn the pages. And this book, We Were Always Here, is an authentic page turner by, as it turns out, a very nice person. Lena, please join us. <laughs> oh, we can't embrace. Can we embrace? Oh, anyway. <laughs> thank you so much, Stephanie, for that incredible introduction. And thank you for giving this book the title. I don't know if you remember, but the original title of this book when it was a thesis here at Cornell was Biophilia, which is awful and a mouthful. And Stephanie said, like, this will never sell, like, make it something else. And that's what it is today. So I have her to thank. I have John Lennon, uh, my other thesis advisor, to thank for propelling this book into reality. And thank you to Cornell, to the English department, to the incredible faculty and staff and to my cohort uh, for the incredible honor of being here. And thank you to the Friends Endowment for this generous honor. Um, I'm going to re read from the book, We Have Always Been Here. And uh, just for context, beyond what Stephanie has already given in her incredible introduction, uh, for this excerpt is just that the protagonist, Grace Park, um, has an android caretaker. She is essentially orphaned, and this android, Glenn, has been her dearest companion and friend for most of her life. So this takes place when she is an adolescent about to leave high school, and uh, here we go. After school, she saw Glenn standing impassively by the gate as usual. He looked no different from a distance, but upon coming closer, she thought she could read something like concern in the angle of his shoulders, or puzzlement. She approached and saw someone talking to him, or rather at him, since Glenn was neither looking at them nor responding. Sudden fear and rage swept her in a dark, acidic wave. It was Alexia, standing there boldly with one of her boyfriends. Respond, she was saying as Park glided up behind them. Answer, reply. It's probably defective, her boyfriend said. 
This was Harry Bipp, Park realized, with the sculpted jaw and the hands that could crush a melon. His parents had had him optimized for a sports scholarship before they'd understood that sports were going extinct. Not enough room in the post-comeback world, and no, one for, no room for it if you were bound for the colonies. Now they were trying to pass him off as a future combat specialist. Park couldn't imagine him specializing in anything except eating junk food to fuel his overgrown body and adjusting himself when he thought no one was looking. It's not defective, Alexia said. The freak probably programmed it not to talk to anybody but her. Glenn's eyes flicked to Park over Alexia's shoulder. His mouth formed a faint frown. Alexia, sensing the look, began to turn. But before she could see Park properly, Park said, what are you doing? Harry Bipp jumped. Alexia squinted. Park had positioned herself so that the sun was at her back, glaring into their eyes if they tried to look at her. It was instinct, she supposed, her reptile brain positioning her on dominant ground. Alexia tried to smile and said, oh, Grace, we were just having a talk with your friend. You don't need to talk to him. Whatever it is, you can ask me. Park looked at Glenn, bent all of her will into her gaze. Silently, he moved to her side. He's a very advanced model, Alexia remarked. We were just admiring his specs. Yeah, Harry Bip rumbled. He's crash, real lifelike. A smile twitched on his face. Park looked at him and thought about how jangled and out of place his jeans must be. A throwback, she thought. A figure beckoned out of an age that didn't exist anymore. No wonder he preferred following Alexia's lead. She knew his place and told it to him with ease. So what do you do, Alexia said to Glenn. Now that she's here, you can answer. Do you just follow Grace around all the time? Leave him alone, Park said in clipped tones. She knew this was a tactic meant to expose her vulnerabilities, but she hated the thought of anyone ridiculing Glenn who couldn't defend himself. It felt as if they'd come into her home without her knowing and rearranged the furniture or stolen her diary and passed it around jeering. She had never known true anger like this before. Frustration, yes, but not rage. How dare they? She felt as if there were a hot, weeping itch in her heart. Glenn, let's go, she said. You don't have to be so protective, Alexia said, still with that round-eyed look of innocence. I was just trying to make conversation. No one's going to steal your walking vibrator. Park turned to her icily and slapped her, open-handed. The force and suddenness of the blow surprised even Park, who felt as if someone had unhinged her own arm and moved it for her. There was a stunned silence, staring. Even Glenn looked vaguely surprised. Alexia's cheek reddened in the afternoon's golden glow. Then she said, you bitch, and wound her hand back. Harry Bip made a kind of hooting noise. Park tensed, and her mind leapt through several strategies, discarding them before the next instant had even passed. She wasn't interested in diffusion or escape, more in overpowering Alexia, incapacitating her, teaching her not to do this again. How much could she hurt her without veering into the domain of the criminal? And would Harry intervene? Park wouldn't win if it was two against one. She had no more time to think. Here came Alexia's hand blurring through the air. Park rounded her shoulder to fend off the blow and said against her will, stop. Glenn moved suddenly, his hand clamped down on Alexia's wrist, catching it in midair. The contact made a hollow clapping sound. Then he looked at Alexia and said quietly, I'm sorry, but I will not permit this. You will do no harm to Grace Park. Alexia gave a kind of scream, a horrible sound, like a train whistle in a movie. Get off me, she shouted. Don't touch me, you fucking clunker. At this, Harry Bip lunged forward and swung his open hand at Glenn's head, roaring like a bear. How absurd, Park thought blurly as she watched him stumble forward, pinwheeling his arms to main balance, maintain balance. It was like an old cartoon, all of them standing there, trading slaps. Glenn, who had faded backward with the glow, said, that was dangerous. If I hadn't moved, you could have damaged your hand. Glenn, Park said, and he released Alexia's wrist smoothly. I apologize, he said to the girl, who was clutching her wrist as if it was in danger of falling off. I am first and foremost Grace Park's guardian. My protection protocols. Help, she was shrieking. Help, it's attacking us. Some passerby had witnessed the altercation, two businessmen and one female student. 
Park saw that they were hurrying over. Or that they knew Glenn was an android she didn't know. Perhaps all they'd seen was two young couples squabbling. But no, she thought. If they thought that, they wouldn't bother interfering. She could see in the whiteness around their lips that they thought they knew what was going on. Rogue android, they were thinking. It's finally happening. We've known it all along. The riots never really went away, Park thought. We need to go, she said to Glenn. She touched his sleeve. Where? His voice was flat and calm. She could see the sensors in his eyes spinning, analyzing the situation. They are blocking the only exit from the schoolyard. Into the school, Park said, waited out until things calmed down. But Glenn was shaking his head. It would not be strategically sound to trap ourselves in a building, he said, particularly one occupied solely by other synthetics. They'd quietly edged back from the center of the commotion by now. Harry Bipp was holding the sobbing Alexia as if she might fall to pieces without his embrace to hold her together. The female student was recording the goings-on with her wrist console, smirking in a tight, nervous way. The two businessmen were listening to Alexia's story, looking over at Glenn and Park suspiciously. One of them was calling someone on his teletooth. You, the one who wasn't calling, said to Glenn, come here. Stay, Park said. Glenn gave no sign that he'd heard the businessman address him. Is that your bot, the man asked. He was young, not that much older than she. A recent college grad, she would have guessed. His arms were too thin for his clear vinyl business suit. She said it just attacked her. She attacked me, Park answered coldly. My android has prevented further violence. It's in his programming. It's going to f I think it's going to have to be taken in. She felt as if someone had injected lead into her spine. I'll see to that, she said. Who are you? We run a robot repair firm, he said, gesturing to himself and the other businessman who was still on the phone. We handle problem bots, malfunctioners. Great, Park said. She suddenly realized that she couldn't unclench her fists. You should turn it over to us. We'll take a look at it and repair whatever's going on in its head. We saw the whole thing. That's not programming. It is. It's not. Look, we'll give you the receipt. You can come and pick it up in a day or two. When Park didn't answer, the angle of the man's shoulders sharpened. All she could read was anger and fear in the lines of his body. He swayed as if preparing to charge. You really need to turn it over. If not to us, then to somebody. Defective chap droids can be a real menace if they're let loose without corrective programming. I am not defective, Glenn said tonelessly. My systems are operating at optimal capacity. The man didn't look at him. It wouldn't know if it was defective, he said to Park. That's the whole point. The Park that should know it's malfunctioning is malfunctioning itself. He's fine, Park snapped. Leave us alone, unless you're the police. Get the police. This was Alexia from amidst the storm of her tears. It hit me. God damn you, Park thought. But before she could reply, she saw the younger man nod to the older one, who is now off the phone. There was a crowd of people in the schoolyard now. Students who hadn't gone far and who had returned when they heard the commotion. Excited laborers and office workers on their routes home from work. Someone said, turn it off, the switch is in its throat. And Park could feel her body drifting in front of Glenn's, stiff, solid, as if she were a glacier. Glenn said quietly, what is the usual procedure in such a case? I don't know, Park said. She couldn't turn to look at him. People were approaching them hesitantly, trying to see how to move her neatly out of the way. Self-defense is required, Glenn said, prompting. Yes, Park said, it always is. Glenn stepped out from behind her then. There was suddenly something small and black in his hand. Park couldn't see it clearly from her periphery. He said calmly, please let us exit peacefully, now. That was all he said, but everyone stopped. A kind of hard, frozen silence fell over the crowd. No one moved. Even Alexia stopped crying. She only looked at Glenn, then at Park, with that classic round-eyed look like a startled infant. Glenn put his hand on Park's back with infinite gentleness and said, thank you, we will leave now. And then they left. The crowd parted for them like water flowing around a rock. Park could feel her shoulders tensing as they passed through, expecting a surprise blow to the face, a hot flash of pain in the back. But there was nothing. No one even turned to watch them go. Why, Park said, when they'd made it a block or two away. She looked behind them, but no one was following. 
The streets were now empty. She hadn't realized how fast her blood had been thudding that entire time. She could feel her heartbeat in her fingertips. Glenn's left hand was still on her back. It was this, he said, and he showed her his right hand briefly. Park felt the dra blood drain out of her head. Glenn was holding a gun. And I will leave it there. Perfect place to leave us. Thank you so much for that, Lena and Julie. Yes to it. Michael Pryor, MFA class of 17, poet. Michael Pryor is the author of Burning Province, which won the Canada Japan Literary Award and the BC and Yukon Book Prizes Dorothy Livesay Poetry Prize. His poems have appeared in places like The New Republic, Poetry, and the Academy of American Poets Poem a Day series. The recent recipient of fellowships from the New York Public Library's Coleman Center and the Jerome Foundation, Pryor is an assistant professor of English at McAllister College. Michael Pryor is also one of the kindest people that I know, and I love that about him, but I also love the fact that he likes corgis and cat videos as much as I do, and sometimes he shares them with me, which makes me feel very special in the world. He is also a phenomenal poet. I could not be more proud to say congratulations on the Freund Prize and welcome. Thank you so much, Lyrae. We, we have a thread. Um, thank you to the Department of Literatures and English. Thank you to all the other readers for your wonderful work. Thank you, Alice Fulton and Aishan Hutchinson, who are my advisors. And thank you to Lynn for putting all this together. Oh, and thank you to the, the Freund Prize Endowment. I'm going to read the first poem in, in my book. Um, it's called 150 Pounds. And the book has a lot to do with the Japanese, American and Japanese Canadian internments during the Second World War. Uh, my maternal grandparents were put in a camp in British Columbia. And this poem is an ekphrastic poem, and it responds to a project by the Japanese Canadian artist Keilu Sumura, who went up and down the west coast of Canada and America and asked fourth and fifth generation Japanese Canadians um, what they would bring if they had to go to a camp, and then photographed what they packed. 150 pounds. Each adult will be allowed 150 pounds, and each child will be allowed 75 pounds of baggage. BC Security Commission, 1942. In some, the luggage lies open like a mouth mid-sentence. In others, closed zippers grimace. What would you have brought? Slippers, a stuffed platypus, a gold watch on a chain, copper pots swaddled in bedding. The hypotheses that thinking can be things, that each decision shrinks the pain mind to the space inside a suitcase. Include lacquered chopsticks, silver forks, a hammer scarred by rust, the orders nailed to telephone poles and doors. Omit what you whispered then, most of what you've seen. I was given 48 hours notice, 24. I passed ice and pines and plains. I rode an iron serpent into the interior beside 400 others. It was humid. It was cold. If pain is remembered to be dismissed, if fear still seeds its rotting forest, this is a gardener's trowel, a blue skein of yarn, a violin, a ukulele, a ukulele, a ukulele. This is a porch light flicked on and off in abscess night. These are pear blossoms falling on the driveway like footprints in black ice. Memories, river stones metamorphic and worn. How many might an able-bodied individual carry through livestock stalls and mud, onto a bus, a train, into a tiny uninsulated shack? 
Most say the same. It could happen again. It is happening now. I couldn't make room for a dogless collar, a houndstooth scarf, a steel urn packed in styrofoam, a letter recording blood's divisive fractions. My father would not have come. My mother, my stepsister, my brother. What matters is not what you bring, but what you keep. She was there. He was too. The book, I often describe it as um, an elegy for living memory, as the last generation who endured the internment um, passed away. And while I was writing this book, um, my, grandma, my grandmother died, um, and she'd raised me when I was young, and I was very close to her. And so uh, this is a poem for her. In Cloud Country. In Cloud Country, water has but two states. We feel the crease between a wave and its cold, between us and the sun. In cloud country, your mind settles its mist across the TV's broken screen, the IV's tape labels, the metal rungs strung along the bed frame like ladders into a hidden room. Here, Kyushu is a doorway left ajar, a nightlight shadow shift. Here, we admit ourselves the paper's ninth and impossible fold, the way we say hello, meaning hold on a little longer, or I don't know, meaning it's true. Errant cells spill like sea salt over the corridor's mirrored linoleum as we shuffle from floor to floor. And you live long enough to see your glasses return to style, your plaid shirts, your knit cardigans. Within our borders, your hair frays cirrus into sky, while that bride, so serious in every photo, never had to be you. Drowsy, draining through a plastic tube, in cloud country you say, that was all so long ago. Each closet a mossy gate, each wormwood cabinet a cabin dissolving in your nowhere backwoods, where the plural is story, the singular skin, and the notice stapled to the door does not make of one face many. Was there ever a quiet street, a pink bungalow, a trio of hunched maples, a cup of cooling sencha waiting in this nation for you? In cloud country you say, it feels like I'm being eaten and choke down spoonfuls of ice cream, lemon jello. We thicken your water with powdered bone. In cloud country, the horizon doesn't sever the sky, but spills upwards, a helix of white smoke, burnt leaves. While the fledglings in our chest bear no desire to leave the nest or rot to barbed wire. At this latitude, the textbooks declare the heart an uncracked robin's egg, the mind a clever mockingbird's, and every morning is a morning you showed us the bitterns, curtained by bulrushes, towering in their sleep. You closed our eyes as we passed the one broken on the boulevard. It is here that you promised to reveal how to uncrimp each beak from its paper bud, how to unfurl each wing with the perfect pressure of fingers not yet talons, veins not yet tunnels of wind and sleet. It is here that you mutter, I had a name, so that we understand Every animal has wings. No dignity and indignity. You kept it all to yourself in cloud country, where the sheets folded you and the crinkled gown exposed you, where the swallows never stood still and never stood for want. We kept them to ourselves. We kept this for you. You plead, leave a window open, a skylight unlocked. We flatten our faces against the glass's double pane. We couldn't finish those final folds alone. You left us for an image of astounding order. There was no order. We listened to the radio for your whereabouts until we too bare throats racked by static, blistered with Coriolis. The fields that stretch behind the boulevard rise and evaporate easy from their bedrock, now no different than bed. In cloud country, it rains newspaper cranes, it cries Fujita scale, it hears your tectonic mumble merge with ours. There is no scale for now and then. You are the paper's 103rd fold, the nebula's gauzed edge. In cloud country, you say thank you. We say thank you.
The book came out over a year ago now, so I'm going to read a new poem, too. Um, this is a palinode, and it's about my mother. And um, I haven't seen my mother in two years because of the pandemic. Um, my family lives in Vancouver, Canada. And this is about her gardening, um, and also about our relationship. Um, and the palinode's a poem that usually retracts a sentiment from a previous poem. Um, my mother and I have a complex relationship. Palinode. My mother is stalking cabbage moths with a tennis racket. She looks most like herself when she tenses and swings over the rows of kale and romaine at the white specks floating through blue shadows. She is bisected by the swaying frame, distanced by the poor resolution of the video my sister just sent. Her left hand is bandaged. Tendinitis from picking caterpillars and eggs off the leaves with chopsticks. As if to prove obsession is its own lineage, I have spent hours checking the sun-stunted shiso for iridescent beetles, bodies tufted with fine hairs like the down on a dandelion seed, spent years wondering what it meant to be her or her parents, uprooted, dispossessed. I can see so clearly time's possession in the way I speak, like her, the preference for detail, for impossible control, how my skin has pocked and wrinkled, the first gray hairs seeding my temples. I am thinking of the time she was enrolled in an ESL class, even though she only spoke English. The time she told me on the phone that because I had left, I couldn't come back. The time I stole $20 from the jar under her bed. Or all the times she corrected my pronunciation. Repeat indistinguishable, inconsolable, inevitable that I won't return home for another year. By then, she will have stopped dyeing her hair. There are no equivalencies, only echoes. I am alone and watching my mother watching something above her head. My mother is swinging and missing. My mother is crying for her mother. My mother is referring to herself as oriental as old. The cabbage moths arrived on the coast in the late 19th century, just before our family. Now these shimmering beetles are weighing down the leaves. When I look back, my mother has become indistinguishable from the shadows under the trees. I'm going to read one last poem, and it's the last poem in the book. And it's a love poem, um, the sort of love poem I can write, which involves brain-eating insects. Um, it's called Wakeful Things, and it begins with this epigraph from Kenko, the medieval Japanese monk. You should never put the new antlers of a deer to your nose and smell them. They have little insects that crawl into the nose and devour the brain. Wakeful Things. Consider that the insects might be metaphor, that the antlers' wet velvet scent might be Proust's Madeline, dipped into a cup of tea adorned with centrifugal patterns of azalea and willow. Those flushing the hill behind this room, walls wreathed in smoke and iron, musk of the deer head above the mantel. He was nailed in place before I was me. Through the floorboards, a caterpillar, stripped from its chrysalis by red ants, wakes as if to a house of flame. Silk frays, like silver horns, like thoughts branching from a brain. After the MRI, my father's chosen father squinted at the wormholes raveling the screen and said, be good to one another. Love, how inelegantly we leave, how insistent we are to return in one form or another. I wish all of this and none of it for us. More sun, more tempest, more fear and fearlessness. More of that which is tempered, carved, and worn, creased into overlapping planes. The way I feel the world's aperture enlarge in each morning's patchwork blur of light and color while I fumble for my glasses beside the bed, lenses smudged by both our hands. When they were alive, those antlers held up the sky. Now what do they hold? Thank you.
There is no scale for now and then. There are no equivalencies, only echoes. Fantastic. Rinia White, MFA 16, writer. Rinia White is the author of Casual Conversation, a Blessing the Boat selection forthcoming in spring 2022. Originally from Maryland, she came of age in Riverdale, Georgia, before earning her BA and MFA from Howard and Cornell, respectively. She received the 2015 Hurston Wright Foundation College Writers Award in Poetry. Her work appears in publications such as The Offing, Slice, Witness, Southern Indiana Review, and elsewhere. She lives in NYC. Renia shares my determination to keep something soft in herself. I admire this about her so greatly, and I could not be more proud to congratulate you on that forthcoming book and on this award. Welcome, Renia White. Now, Larry knows that was about to make me cry and I had to keep myself together. <laughs> I'm so grateful to be here. Um, hearing your voices, so beautiful to be under your voices again. I'm going to cry. I can't look at you. Okay. Look over here. <laughs> um, thank you, everybody, uh, Department of Literature in English, um, all the folks who made this possible, of course. Freud Prize, um, Lynn, all your wonderful communication and direction, and especially Lyra and Aisha. You were so wonderful when I was here. You remain wonderful. I can't do this. Okay. Yes, I can. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to read some poems. I'm going to start with the second poem in the collection, then I'll go to the first, and then I will dance around. As far as you know, nothing can kill you. I tumble out my own side window sometimes. It's all the leaning and looking, the hoping to notice again changing glory. My friend likes to say, as long as he is here, I will not fall all the way down. But let something in me leap off its own mantle, and I am all eyes cast upward and beyond welling how and despair and all the women, all the sunless women. Yet every sky I've needed for its beauty has surrendered. The clouds do go there, the snow, the streamers, the gilded do-rag atop my head, I better not worry nor hang, lest atrocity, atrocity. But people can only save you if the timing's right. Hearsay. Okay. So you are telling me, the girl dared say, I can't just let you have my life. Not like that, Your Honor. And he sentenced her to a bedazzled tightrope and a room without a window and a son that doesn't know her name. Middle passage for this? You think the girl doesn't know her own shame, given that face she wears? Think she doesn't know where she is ain't where she was put down to begin with? That her first season was someone else's harvest? Some people get to want and need and be met in it. Some just the mouth, just the teeth. Some eat and they say, why all the hunger? We, we together, you all right? As low as that, let's move to a love poem, shall we? Gather them and give them back to me. After Toni Morrison.
I don't have the wherewithal to die today. Not with you here. Thank you for that. You say things could be simple, and sometimes they are. It's true. We only need what we need in order to have all we need. Nothing more except love, which is a texture you say you don't understand, but look at this bread in my mouth, your hand in mine, although we barely touch, because how outlandish <laughs> to fill even further beyond the sure blessing. So your hand isn't in mine, but I feel it there when I'm awake, asleep, inside my mind room. I touch everything I walk by or into, but you here and us with hands in case we need them, I think this is it. But if you want to make it more complicated, I agree. In this village, in this village, we measure the distance between the prayer and its mouth, the chorus and each of its pains. We know that you can't slice a chorus into some, that if you separate the mouth from what it yells, the yell is just an announcement in the spirit of itself. The kids know well enough to say, why I gotta die to be a body? But then the elders say, I even died in the spirit of being alive once. To which the kids reply, I am not here in the name of myself or something dead. I came in the thing I pray with and for. And some of the elders cry while singing the same old song anew. Say, finally and at last, and in the beginning. This is kind of fun. <laughs> okay. The poem, not, not this. This is fun too. I am not prepared for the inverse of this. If everything always brings with it its opposite, Every time something happens, one can ask, what if it hadn't, and still be relevant? How dangerous a logic we've made. Proof is what happens afterward to show us the during was true. We had to find a way to promise what we are doing is worthwhile. So we decided to imprint the now for later. Perhaps we cannot be trusted to remember. Perhaps we know that a new dream is a correction of the old one, no matter what we mean to feel. So you walk the street two minutes too late, and so you live, or miss your old lover, or your new one, or in pursuit of ourselves, we can meet another us. Then, one day, a sad woman enters you and clears your desk says, I am the new. And what do you say to such a gentle intrusion, so sure of itself? You'll think someone else organized it. You'll think it must be yours. Misgiving. I followed you down the road of yourself. And when we found the uglies, you said, don't look. And I said, but I am here, in you. You brought me here to show me what not to look at. I misheard what you called this and yourself, but I knew not to guess aloud, not to grasp anything by what it incited. In order to love you, I had to forget my first thought. So I walked to the wrong town and built a house. Because I couldn't confess I'd gone the wrong way, confidently, due to love. Unable to turn around and fell 
in front of everyone. Yes, I walked to the wrong place and stayed. Okay, my poems are kind of short, so <laughs> I'm realizing that I might do a couple more than I thought. Um, more love, love. Why everybody want to be singular? I insist upon the chorus of myself. A lover I never had stands at his kitchen counter, hiding behind the last clean glass, head bowed, crying, because I'm away, or not his yet. Or he is looking for me in a mug or upturned palm, the way a woman in a tarot shop that is really her living room would. That happened once, and it was doing the telling. The man and I shouldn't have been. I didn't realize, even when she didn't bother to read our fortunes differently. All of our palms in the same room, she stared at the floor and said, you want to be good. You want people to think you are good. He is, and I am, and we are as now, as sometimes I weep shower apologies for men I tried to throw myself away from, who came back from the almost left to tell me, girl, I suppose I could, but I'm tired. Mole on the lip of one, scar at the brow of another, reduced to the markings, Men are larger narratives with a single lingering detail some other force inscribed. One walks into the front of my temple. Birds smash into the door before knocking. It looks like everything he's ever gone through, every permeable feminine everlasting. I am watching from the tower, hoping he makes it all the way up here so I can know it can be done. I believe, but I'd like to know, too. That sounded like my heart. I, I feel like you all can hear my heartbeat. <laughs> um, uh, so there are two casual conversation poems in the collection. Um, I'm going to read one of them. I actually read the first one at the graduation reading. Um, Casual conversation. I want to see less when I look at a life, but all the buttons and bullets riddling everything. The way we can say, and all the gilding everywhere, and go, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. My lover's mouth is gilded with my name. My dream mouth gilded with rose gold fronts. My childhood stippled with what we put away. Where we put it and why gilds our town of manifest, manifest. My favorite boy shining, my sister out of jail. My mind picks up where I was left. In case you'd consider it. A vacation is a personal decision, a sign you hang in your own script. I am a woman made of flesh, first in this context, and somehow the cashier asked the second woman in line for her order. I have never understood my look and how others understand it. I have things I want to hide from, but for every bridge I've built above, I've jumped back below into my own blue rummage. I've never kept anything I feared I wouldn't. My anxieties have been proven, and perhaps the knuckle and gash of the world are true as a time clock is true. But I am on vacation from that ache, on vacation from the way it looks and what it brings. Don't have to answer to it, because I declared, not now. And some things are respected, once claimed. Some things get what they're due. I'm gonna read just one more. I know you don't need me. We are far beyond need. All of us wanted. 
tethered to some kind of want, wretched or not. There are simply too many of us to explain otherwise. Someone wanted this reality to be possible for me. Someone wanted me into existence, and I know you don't need me, but when I was born, a song began to play, and I like it. It is playing for my liking exclusively. If you touch me, you'll have touched a someone brightly loved and lived for. Now, on purpose, I have requested something small that you owe me. Give it to me because it's owed, not because I asked. I declare that I never did ask, but told you, I am here and I want to be. Plush, a dark, lush stole round the neck of a woman whose gait says, see me when you see me. I mean, really look. Or one day, a tree fell and learned to announce itself made itself your kind of loud. Thank y'all so much. Oh my goodness. Uh, good evening, everybody. It's only left for me to uh, hand over a lot of money uh, to these fine <laughs> poets and writers, which I'm very unhappy to do. I have the checks here and certificates. You will have the certificates, the checks I will keep. Um, can we give them another hand for... <clears throat> These former students are proof that there are no teachers or even teaching, but the zeal to learn from each other, which at its best is the deep knowledge of love. Some of you may be aware that graduates of our MFA program are eligible to teach here at Cornell as lecturers in English for the two years following their graduation these lectureships are paid for in part by the generosity of the Philip Freund, of Philip Freund, Cornell class of 1929, whose will provided our program with an endowment intended to benefit creative um, writing graduate students. Philip Freund's generosity did not end there. The Freund endowment has also made a new benefit available for which we're gathered here um, which is the Philip Freund Prize, an honor of $5,000 to every graduate student who publish a new work upon leaving Cornell. And it is my pleasure and honor to now officially hand over the certificates to our uh, readers and thank them for making the marvelous journey to Ithaca um, once again, so when I say the names, I'm not sure what order these are in. Um, I guess I should put my mask back on. I'm not sure what the protocol is, um, but I'm gonna call you each one by one to come and receive a certificate. Um, I'm, I guess it's fine if you have your mask off and I have mine. Um, I'm not sure. <laughs> Um, so, Julie. I should say, when you get your certificate, please stay right there. <clears throat> um, Lena. actually in perfect order. Michael. <laughs> Renia. Please 
please order their books and pre-order Rainier's books and then come join us upstairs in 258 Goldwyn Smith Hall uh, to talk to these very fine writers and poets. Thank you for coming and see you next year at the Zalaznik Reading Series. Please visit our website to check out um, what's happening in the spring. Thank you.